Today is a bit of a biggie for us at Manchester Theatres because we are here with the Kenny Wax from Kenny Wax Productions. I mean, we are talking the phenomenon that is six, as well as other huge shows. We're talking all of Mischief Theatre, the Goes Wrong shows, both in the theatres and on television, the, the show that was on there as well. We're talking children's shows such as Hey Dougie and The Worst Witch, newer shows, Identical the Musical and Darren Brown's Unbelievable, and of course, classics such as Top Hat and Bugsy Malone. But we are here today to talk about two shows that are currently both running at the Lowry right through till January. We are, of course, talking fantastically great women who changed the world, and we're going on a bear hunt. So Thank you so much for joining us today, Kenny. I know you must be so, so busy, so we do appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Lovely to be here, Karen. Thank you. So before we get into the shows in a bit more detail, um, tell me, first of all, what is it like being a producer? So what is the kind of from concept right through to creation? How does that journey go and roughly how long can it take? Or is that like how long is a piece of string, I suppose? Every production is very different, to be honest. You mentioned uh, in the introduction, the show last year that did come to the um, Lowry, it was called Identical. It was based on The Parent Trap. That took about nine years, believe it or not. Um, it was uh, a real labour of love. It took two or three years to get the rights. Then I had to wait for the right composer and lyricist that told me they weren't available for about three years. And then COVID struck just as we were about to launch. So that was nine years. Um, but then the story with another show that you just mentioned, Six the Musical, was incredibly quick because uh toby marlow and lucy moss were part of the cambridge university musical theatre society in their final year after they'd done their finals they took a show up to edinburgh called six it played in literally a conference room i didn't see that production but they brought that back to london to well in fact to cambridge where they were doing three performances to just show some of their university friends before all going their separate ways and getting real jobs and um i did see one of those and that was in about october of i'm going to say 2018 could be 2017 and within six months we had a professional production on i think it was probably the june of the following year actually maybe about seven or eight months but that's incredibly short and that production literally kind of toured for a few weeks went into the west end briefly did another season at the Edinburgh Festival and is now running all over the world. And I cannot tell you, you know, between sold out in London, sold out on its UK tour, it's coming back to the Lowry next summer for three weeks where I think it's going to sell out again. We're playing in Toronto for a year. We've been on Broadway for two years. We've got a big North American tour that just goes from state to state every week or two. Uh, we're on Norwegian cruise line ships. We played Australia. We played <laughs> Korea. I've just been out to Amsterdam with the show next year. It's in Germany, Switzerland, Italy, just doing deals with China, the wow. Philippines, um, Japan. So, you know, uh, incredible speed of success for what was, you know, a homegrown, a homegrown university show. Yeah. And the momentum of it. And like you say, it's just kept going and going and going. And I think um, Fantastically Great Women Who Changed the World has that same kind of vibe about it. It's It's got um, current music. Um, it's about historical figures. Um, so for people who don't yet have or haven't yet seen the show, um, could you tell them what Fantastically Great Women is about? Sure, yes, it would be very easy to think, Karen, that the producer of Six had another great idea. <laughs> That's quite an obvious idea. Why don't we do another historical show about women? But actually, and this might be hard to believe, but for Dusty Great Women, the journey began two or three years before Six, oh, and it was about four or five years in the making. But again, it took a little bit of time to get the rights, and then it took a while to put the creative team together and then to actually commission the show and the difference with Marlowe and Moss was they already had the show. It had already run at the Edinburgh Festival. This was a brand new show. So again, in answer to your question, I, as producer, uh, once I've decided upon the title of the show that we're going to do, um, I employ a team of people, in the case of this being a commission, a team of people that can actually deliver me a production to my brief. 
And the brief was we wanted it to be a pop musical. And we were talking to a brilliantly talented woman called Miranda Cooper. And Miranda's had about five or six number one hits with Girls Aloud, Sugar Babe. She's written for Kylie Minogue. She's a really kind of well-known um, female um, composer of pop and was just starting to get into musical theatre. Uh, but we really wanted Fantastic Great Women to be great fun, light, frothy, poppy. Um, and then we were lucky enough also to attract a very star uh, book writer called Chris Bush, who'd had a couple of big hits in Sheffield, most recently one called Standing at a Sky's Edge that started mm -hmm. in Sheffield, a musical about a Sheffield council estate that then came to the National Theatre and is now transferring to the West End. So we've got two people right at the top of their uh, game, so to speak. And the idea was to um, to take Kate Pankhurst's picture books. So Kate Pankhurst is an author and illustrator who lives in Sheffield, a distant relative, amazingly, of mm -hmm. Emily Pankhurst, who'd written these beautiful picture books. And this particular one, fantastic, great women who changed the world, has female icons such as Jane Austen, Frida Kahlo, Emmeline Pankhurst, Rosa Park, Gertrude Eddeley, who swam the channel, Mary Curie, who conducted the first X-ray patients to help um, cancer, X-ray, X-rays to help cancer, cancer patients, um, uh, machines kind of tackle the, the source of the cancer. So all these incredible women in one place, uh, actually in a gallery of greatness, which it's called in the in the show and in the book, where a young girl of about 11 years old um, gets separated from her school party on a school visit to the museum, to the gallery. She wonders where everyone is. She thinks she has no worth because they've all left her behind and they're not even noticed. And then these incredible women come to visit her and share their stories. She knows some of them. She doesn't know all of them. And she manages to find a positive spin on herself and her own family situation, which is tricky at the time. And it finishes up in a fantastic kind of celebration of um, female uh, empowerment, um, as does six, but in a different way. It's probably aimed, and one of the reviews captures it beautifully. It says it's bold and sassy, like six's little sister. So although it's absolutely enjoyable for all of the family, there's a kind of you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 kind of sweet spot. But I mean, my office staff, a lot of women who are in their 20s just adore the show because um, it's so kind of relevant. It's really interesting. And so many times they say, we wish that we could have seen this sort of show when we were younger because the life lessons are so important. So I really would say hand on heart, you know, this is a, a really fabulous show. It's probably similar in its kind of vibe to something like maybe Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It's that sort of kind of colourful, fun, frothy um, show, which uh, really appeals to all the family. Yeah. It, Just for it, girls, I should say. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it is. It's so it's educational. It's entertaining. You've said it's empowering, but not just for women, because yes, for women, of course. But it has that message in there about, you know, not allowing that inner saboteur to get that get to you and um and about confronting your your own self-doubt and saying that you know look um you can't change the world on your own use people around you help you know accept yeah, so yeah yeah, yeah it, it's beautiful and as you've said there's this each character each of the different fantastic women that come in have got their own vibe they've got their own their, their own flavor like Frida Kaolo comes in and there's all the color and it's it's brilliant and the, the performers all um multi-role as well don't they they all yeah. play more than one one fantastic woman which is That's right yeah it's incredible do you so if I was to interview one of them they would probably tell me that their fantastic women were the roles that they played. Do you have within the show, do you have like a favourite moment of one of them that comes forward? Not necessarily historically, but just theatrically. There's a character um, played by an actress called Chloe Hart, who actually was one of our six queens on the previous tour. Uh, when you've got somebody that's just that talented, you just want to kind of grab them and put them into your next show. But as it happens, Chloe's track... Um, she doesn't have a full song of her own because she plays Gertrude Eddeley, who has a kind of trio song. She plays Jane Austen. Um, she plays one of the uh, Marie's, uh, Mary Anning, who's a fossil uh, collector. Um, 
But uh, as you've seen the show, Karen, there's just a moment in the Jane Austen where it sounds like she's about to sing a big number just as she's leaving the stage. And that always just gives me a big thrill because you get <laughs> this incredible voice, but also it's a bit kind of tongue in cheek. Ah, you thought you were going to get yeah. you know, another number and she gets cut short. So, Come on, we've got to go. We've got to go. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, Frida Kahlo's song... Uh, sung by one of our other um, tremendous uh, actors, Eleanor, is is really fun, as you said, colourful. But then you've got Rosa Parks, who has, sings a, a lullaby at the yeah. end. Um, the great um, uh, the great actress, Leah Vassal, who also just came out of the West End production of Six. We've ended up with quite a lot of the Six cast. <laughs> if you really do like Six, or you did like Six when you've seen it, yes. this is populated by ex-Six alumni. And uh, Leah Vassal's... Um, lullaby as Rosa Parks is just beautiful and it has kind of a twist at the end that I won't explain but another character kind of comes on stage quite unexpectedly and it's really beautiful quiet moving moment that really gives you kind of time for reflection yeah and like you've said there's a lullaby there's the pop music there's um there's an element of rap with one of the numbers um which surprised me because there was a, a gentleman sat near the front who brought his daughter and he was proper bopping away to the show oh, well that's the local girl who i haven't mentioned the local in terms of jen caldwell being from up north yes. and also singing emily and pank her song which he was also from up north so that's a really kind of local connection yeah. so yeah i've realized i just kind of missed out jen um <laughs> and, but every song has something and then of course our very young uh, actress or seemingly young actress, um, George, Georgia, who plays Jade, Jade yeah. is just absolutely gorgeous. And, uh, you know, the heart kind of melts for this child. Uh, George is older than her playing uh, than her playing age, actually. But, you know, because she's so vulnerable and it's such a kind of beautiful performance. Well behaved women rarely make history. See the smoke trail. Sees the world like you do, and that is fantastic. Fantastically great! So moving from that book onto the second show we currently have at the Larry, which needs no story explaining, we're going on a bear hunt, the award-winning book. Because it's so big, does that... I'm sure it adds an excitement, but does it kind of add this um, pressure of responsibility to, to get it right? It's a funny story behind that one because we set up a family division for my company, family production division, about 18 or 20 years ago. And we had some very strong titles. We had we were working with tall stories and we had some of the Julia Donaldson's Gruffalo, Gruffalo Child Room on the Broom. And then we developed a tiger who came to tea. And around the same time as that, we also were looking at where you're going on a bear hunt. And the agent, so what you have to do, Karen, when you're if you're using IP, so that's an existing piece of material we've not created ourselves you have to go to the agent of the authors and say we'd like to do a production we think this is a great title um and the agent on this case said ah oh, well as it happens there are two productions around the uk currently running so why don't you go and have a look at them so i went to see one of them in london and i felt it was very formulaic and almost as you could have turned the pages of the book of the picture book you kind of got very much kind of the story being unfolded and that, I thought, was kind of nice and pleasant to watch, and I'm sure the audience enjoyed it. But it wasn't particularly um, unusual or anarchic or interesting. And then I saw another production around the same time in Bristol, which was being directed by a wonderful uh, director, uh, Sally Cookson. And Sally uses um, quite a lot of uh, kind of improv in developing the work with her actors. She doesn't really go, she uses the script of the book but then she kind of creates something kind of with the actors, um, which is quite an unusual process. And she just had invented something so brilliantly playful with this cast that she had in Bristol. So when they go through mud, you don't literally see them traveling through the mud. It's a kind of version of 
hand painting with brown paint, having a muck around of each other's clothes, but also kind of putting pictures on a wall. When you go through um, the water, there's kind of loads of pails of bucket water. We don't represent a river in a kind of traditional storytelling way. It's, it's all more inventive. And Sally's concept was that each of the places where you go to on the journey of the family is another exploration of play, a different way of looking at play. There's an origami moment. There's a beautiful thing with snow at the end. There's sticks with kind of white snow, streaky snow, you know, it's just so there's water pistols, there's mud. There's, there's I got wet. Kind of, uh, there you go. And it's just really clever. And what's fabulous is if you listen to parents going on the way out, they're really beaming when they say, I was really wondering how they were going to tell that story. And I never imagined it could be like that. And that's real, really a pleasure. Yeah. Because, you know, what we want to do is empower our artists in this case the director sally cookson to devise is really the term to devise a show based on all of her skills and the intellectual property but not necessarily follow you know um the picture book although i think we probably do use all the words from the book itself but in rather a kind of um because again the if you read the book from start to finish it would probably take five minutes and we do a stage show for one hour and, and some of the most fun moments is when the dog gets to play all the musical instruments so again really good fun it is it's brilliant and like you say it's just it is play and it's stuff that can then go home and be recreated hmm. uh, I mean like the forest is made out of cardboard boxes where they can go through it and um, even the beginning, you know, they come in through the audience and then they're back out in the audience with water pistols. It's so immersive. And Very good fun. Yeah, I, I, I have never been to a play where it was full of, like, nursery children and, and like, reception early years. And, it, and the, the vibe, it was just alive with squeals of laughter. And, and it made... I, I just was laughing because they were laughing as well. Mm. It, yeah, it was brilliant. And there's that panto vibe as well with with the songs. We're going on mm. a bit the, the we're going on a bear hunt and turn mm. into the songs and this half sing it, then this half sing it. So everybody is continually involved. We don't want them just to literally sit passively and no. watch us put on a show. It's very much a two way thing. Um, yeah. And, it, yeah. and it's celebrating 15 years. I mean, yeah. It, yeah, 15 years. It's travelled the world, this one, hasn't it? It has, yeah. Again, very lucky with, with it. Um, you know, it's not one of the most current books, but I think it probably is a book that a lot of parents are still, yeah. you know, reading to their kids or even grandparents reading to their kids. Um, and it's hard with this children's books coming onto the market all the time, but it's interesting how the, re the best ones do kind of endure. They do last mm. much the test of time. have your other huge success with Mischief Theatre. So I'm curious to know, when the first one kind of came out, um, the play that goes wrong, was it from there? Was it kind of you saying, we need more, we need more? Or was it was it the Mischief Theatre saying, oh, we need more? Or was it kind of both of you together saying, we've got something here, let's, let's continue this? What happened in the very early days is that um, I was asked by a friend to see a one-act play called The Play That Goes Wrong in a little studio theatre in London. It had about 
100 seats. I think we went on a Thursday matinee. And I thought, it's very funny, but around me, the people were literally crying with laughter. But it was on a tiny little set in a tiny little theatre. And such was this incredible response around me that I said to my friend, look, let's meet the actors who were also the authors of the play at the end. And we said, very impressed. Why don't you come and have a chat about maybe a kind of more commercial production? Because you can't make any money in an 80-seat theatre with a cast of nine people, that doesn't <laughs> happen at all. So they came into my office a couple of days later and we talked about a plan and I said, look, let me call some regional theatres and just ask if they fancy taking the show. And I think the title of The Play That Goes Wrong, it just says to you, this is going to be fun um, and crazy. So we were developing the first product. We said to them, "It's got you've got to make it into two acts. You can't really tour. Six accepted, Karen. You can't really tour a one <laughs> play it's not very popular the venues don't like it because they want to earn money from the bars in the interval you've got to tour a two-act play so we the writers very cleverly extended it into two acts we started touring around the country more and more venues heard how well it was doing and booked on this six-week tour became 22 weeks and on about the 17th or 18th week one of the west end theater owners came and said look i think this could really fit very nicely into one of my theaters and that was uh, the Duchess. And next year marks our 10th year in the West End with that play in that theatre. And around the same time, they were actually also writing Peter Pan Goes Wrong. And my friend and I said, well, look, just in case this works, we better take the rights <laughs> to Peter Pan Goes Wrong. And that's also in the West End right now. Yeah. Pretty much almost sold out, touring the country, the side of its West End run. Um, and then the success of those two have very much spawned, as you intimated earlier, uh, I think two TV series, which we've done both with the BBC, um, Primetime BBC, and about three Christmas specials. We've also done a Nativity Goes Wrong, Peter Pan Goes Wrong, and Christmas Carol Goes Wrong. So it's become a business. We have about four or five people in my office who just work on the mystery shows now. They've been produced in 50 countries around the world. Um on every continent. Uh, right now, we've got a dozen or so um, licenses. We've just opened amazingly in the Ukraine, where they are having such an amazing time. They sent me a video thanking me oh. for kind of bringing joy and comedy and laughter back to that terrible, terribly war-torn country. Um, I've seen it in Budapest. I've seen it in North America. I've seen it in Paris. Um, not gone to some of the most far-flung places, but interestingly, Sometimes we take our, what we call a replica production, which is the identical production. Sometimes we just say, you can have the show mm -hmm. and they will have their own designer, their own director, and they will create their own show. It kind of depends what the market is like, but it has become a bit like six, really. These mm -hmm. two things uh, kind of, you know, mini industries within my company, which we have several people uh, kind of looking after each of those two brands, which is very exciting. It is. It really is. And, what I also find very exciting just before we go is that we've said you've got these two shows at the Larry, Fantastically Great Women Who Changed the World, and we're going on a bear hunt. So not only are they in the building of the Larry where there's a few different theatres, they're in the same theatre, sharing the same stage and doing quick turnarounds. I mean, that's that's surely unheard of. Well, actually, bizarrely, in North America and in New York, where I'm going this week to see one of them, we have uh, a venue off Broadway called New World Stages, which got a whole number of 299, 399, 499 seat theatres. And we have two shows. We have The Play That Goes Wrong and Mind Mangler, which is a yes. comedy magic show. And they're playing in literally next door theatres. <laughs> the American company of Play That Goes Wrong is, is an American cast, but the, it's a British cast who do the Mind Mangler so they can oversee um yeah so uh it is unusual but it's not uh it's, we've not we've not and, and actually the lowry does tend to at christmas have a show in the keys which then also has a children's show on these so we've worked with the lowry for many years it's, it's not the first time we've done it but i don't know if you know karen but i'm actually from manchester myself you probably <laughs> possibly can't tell from my accent but um i went to william hume's grammar school um oh, okay. Altrincham prep uh, born in South Manchester, big Man City fan. Sorry for the Man United fans. Yeah, that's me, Man um, United. <laughs> but uh, you know, we were getting on so well, Kenny. We were getting we were, on so well. We have a lot of family in Manchester, and uh, you know, it's a place, it's a town that's obviously very close to my heart. So yeah. it's lovely to bring these shows back, kind of home, really. I feel, and um, 
yeah, it's always it's always lovely to come and visit. Yeah, well, thank you so, so much. We've got two right now. We've got another one coming in summer. Please keep them coming to the Lowry. Please keep them coming to Manchester because we will keep coming to watch them. So Please thank do. you. That's an absolute pleasure. Lovely to be on. You too. Have a lovely Christmas as well. Thanks, Karen. Thank you.